I'm Dr. Lauren Gerson, Senior Associate Editor for Gastrointestinal Endoscopy, and it's my honor and privilege today to be interviewing Dr. Peter Cotton, who's Professor of Medicine at MUSC. Yes. And we're going to be interviewing Dr. Cotton about his paper coming out in GIE regarding credentialing uh, practices in hospitals across the United States for physicians who perform ERCP. Right. Now, Dr. Cotton did a very interesting study where he sent out a survey to gastroenterologists in the United States to try to figure out how many hospitals actually have uh, privileges in, uh, in place for credentialing physicians who perform ERCP. And you had about 1,100 uh, responders to yes. the survey. Yeah. Um, and one of the surprising things was that only about 40% of the hospitals actually had strict requirements for credentialing in ERCP. Well, it, var it varied uh, uh, between initial credentialing and re-credentialing. Um, I got into this because of my practice and my, and my acting as a medical expert in lawsuits. Uh, it's it clear to me that there were a number of people practicing who perhaps should not be. And ERCP is different from other GI endoscopy procedures and it's only done in hospitals. And hospitals have credentialing committees. It's also different in the sense that it's about 100 times more dangerous than the things that, other things that are done. So the credentialing committees are supposed to make sure that the only competent people do those procedures. 10 years ago, there was a publication that showed that only something like 10% of hospitals in a survey at that time uh, followed ASG guidelines. And so I sent out this survey. Um, for initial credentialing, it was actually 21% of the hospitals had no written guidelines of any sort. There were no guidelines. Uh, for recredentialing, it was actually more than 50% had no written guidelines, which was a shocker. Uh, and you go into it in more detail, you find there is uh, the, the criteria that were used for those with guidelines were tremendously variable. Um, numbers of cases perhaps uh, that should be done in some cases uh, less than 10 in one, one hospital required only one ERCP to have been done in the last year to maintain credentials. So I'm just very concerned about that. Uh, and the issue, of course, is, is what can be done about it. Um, hospitals have been sued uh, for uh, when mistakes are made by people who obviously were incompetent, but that doesn't seem to have been a big enough incentive so far. I'm actually uh, submitting a paper to one of the hospital administrative type uh, journals pointing this out because this paper in GIE will not be read by the people who really need to read it. <laughs> it's uh, singing to the choir uh, so that it's the hospital credentialing committee people and the legal people in the hospitals that actually need to understand, hey, how dangerous this procedure is. Or can be. Uh, so the ASG has just, in 2017, issued new guidelines on credentialing for ERCP, but I guess there's major questions is, number one, how many procedures should people do? And typically, looks like the bar is set around 200. But then the other major question is, what about the quality of the ERCP? In other words, right. are people completing the exam successfully, you know, performing sphincterotomy successfully, and so forth? Right. Numbers are difficult. Uh, the actual advice is that thou shalt been hands-on in at least 200 procedures before you can be assessed for competence. It's not, when you've done 200, you're okay. Uh, and also, nobody says how, how long you should be actually involved in the procedure for it to count as a case. One lawyer was trying to argue with me that if his client was in the room, it counted as a case, <laughs> without being hands-on at all. Um, the, 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 the fundamental criterion is whether people can actually finish what they start off doing. And for most procedures, that involves deep biliary cannulation. So one of the most important metrics is can you get deep into the bile duct in at least 85%, maybe 90% is what the ASG has most recently said. The guidelines are very comprehensive, but they don't provide actually a template for hospital credentialing committees to use. It, it's a, a lot of verbiage, but there are no real specific questions that, that they could use to actually clarify whether somebody was competent or not. And the, the number needed to, to be done every year is, has got to depend on previous experience. I haven't personally done an ERCP in five years, but I could probably do one quite well, because I've done it for 40 years. Uh, so that somebody 
who's done thousands could probably do quite well with 50 a year, but somebody who's marginal out of training is not going to do very well. Um, and what do you think you should do with these multi-specialty groups where there may be only be one person trained in ERCP and they may be taking calls sporadically and so their, their exposure to these cases is not on a regular basis? Well, I think one of the reasons why a number of people do very few ERCPs is because the group wants to have enough people in the group to, to make sure that they don't have to take call every night or every weekend. Uh, and indeed, I know that from some of our trainees who've got into practice, not properly trained in ERCP, but have been told that they're on call for ERCP, just so that not everybody has to, do, I mean, so that the other people don't have to take so much call. Uh, it comes down to the hospitals, uh, the hospital credentialing committees. They've got to do a much better job. So do you think these current guidelines are going to change? The problem, I mean, the guidelines are okay, okay. It's just that the, you know, nobody's reading them apart from you and I. <laughs> um, and the people who read these articles, uh, it's preaching to the choir. Uh, we don't, it's the lawyers and the credentialing committees who actually need to understand more what the issue is. One thing that would make a huge difference, and I've been a, a vocal uh, commentator about this over the years is getting something like GI Quick involved in ERCP. GI Quick, as you know, is a, a voluntary but very successful now uh, benchmarking website for colonoscopy and more recently EGD. I'd set up a similar thing called the ERCP Quality Network uh, years and years ago, which as a pilot, which allowed people to upload their data and to show what, the, what they were achieving, sort of report card idea. And I wrapped that up after a while because GI Quick was going to include ERCP. In fact, I, I wrote some of the metrics for them, that's five years ago, and they still haven't actually included it. If, if GI Quick had ERCP, uh, then the hospital credentialing committees, when they know about it, would say, hi, have you, let's see your data. That would make a huge difference. I've been writing to the presidents of the ASG and the ACG who jointly do A the GI Quick, who jointly sponsored GI Quick, asking them to include ERCP. <laughs> and I ask them public again now, please include ERCP in GI Quick. Now, most fellowship programs initially used to be two years and they were three years and, and fellows used to be trained in ERCP as part of their training, but now it's pretty standard across the country to, to ha require a fourth year to have ERCP training. Right. So do you think that's going to change the credentialing process or the... Well, it, yeah, it, it'll help eventually, but of course there's, you know, there's 30 years worth of people out there uh, who, who didn't do their fourth year training uh, who are still doing ERCP for one reason or another. They're gradually giving it up because, uh, the, because better trained younger people are coming into practice uh, and they could do very well doing colonoscopy all day. So things will change slowly in that regard. There are certainly now a lot more people trained in the fourth year to a much higher level. So ERCP has changed so much. Initially it was just a sort of a diagnostic procedure with a little bit of sphincterotomy for stones. But now it's become a very complex therapeutic procedure that really deserves proper training. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Cotton, for discussing this very important paper. Thank you.